Good morning, everybody. We welcome you this morning to our worship service at First Baptist Torrance. We're so glad you're here. We're going to worship the Lord Jesus. We're going to sing his praises and learn from his word. And as I say that, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to Psalm 68, verses uh, 4 through 6. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exult before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. We worship a wonderful Lord. Amen. We're going to praise him now. Randy. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand as we sing all three stanzas of Heaven Came Down. It's number 510 in your hymnals if you want to look. Otherwise, the lyrics are overhead. Heaven Came Down. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transition which quickly was made, when as a sinner I came, took up the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Sing it out. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope, now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions of life. And it's because of that wonderful day, when at the cross I believe. Rich is eternal and blessings supernal, from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. Great singing. Blessing supernal. Supernal is a synonym for supernatural. Now let's turn and greet our neighbors and say hello to them and make a new friend.
Well, one thing's for sure. TFB really knows how to party. Can I get an amen? Party in the spirit, y'all. So I'm taking open offerings for a youth, uh, youth pastor that desperately needs coffee. We just got back from summer camp. And I'm just asking for an extra special, well, grace and blessing and prayer for our counselors who did really good this week and put up with your kids. Just kidding. And uh, God was really moving. We got a little video prepared for y'all, but as per request from the Leonardo family, I'm going to sit up here in these. So let's all see what God has done this week. If you can please direct your attention to the screen. Um, Pastor Matt, uh, we had another exciting week up here at camp. Uh, it's really, really awesome to see all the students not only bond and grow closer together, but to see their faith explode and then grow closer to God. Um, this is just a couple of the interactions and stories we have from this week. And also, I want you to know that God's not done yet. Um, he's still got another chapel service for us to hear from his word and, and connect with him and make these impactful, influential decisions in our lives as counselors and pastors, but also in the students' lives. So you're going to hear a little bit from them because they'll do all the bragging about Jesus for us. What God has shown me this camp is um, I don't have to have all my problems on my shoulders. I can give them up to him and I don't have to worry all the time or be anxious or be scared. And also worship is really lit and I was scared to put my hands up. But now I'm not, so yeah. I think uh, God spoke to me in many ways in this camp, but I think one of the main things that he really spoke to me was um, God is always forgiving. He's always there for you. He's got your back on your highs, your lows. He's always with you no matter what. And yeah, that's really what spoke to me. What God has shown me this week is mostly how impactful worship can be in my life. And it was really, really powerful to me this week because I usually don't get moved by worship and like spiritual things, but this was really an eye-opener for me and I feel like I can surrender a lot of things in my life to Him and it's made me feel overall just more safe and comfortable in my faith. Um, this week God has shown Himself to me in different ways than I've ever felt before. I've never felt worship like this before and um, you know, when I go down the mountain and when I go to college, I really just want to keep this bond that I've formed, the new bond that I've formed up here, and um, to just continue to grow with my ebbs and flows in my faith, and yeah. Hi, I'm Jennifer. <laughs> God has shown me from this camp that all my problems, it's not really problems, that um, God has got me, and he has answered all my questions just from camp. And I'm really glad because those problems, those, I've been struggling for almost like two years now, and I'm just glad that he's here with me. Um, some ways God has, you know, revealed himself or kind of helped me during this camp is kind of in, is shown through the bonds that I formed with, with all the other people. People here seem so nice, so friendly, so outgoing, and they're so willing to accept a stranger into their group which I found that was, which I found different from every other like kind of social get together I think I've ever been to. My name is Daniel and what God's been teaching me in this retreat is that I shouldn't feel all insecure about my faith in God inside or outside the church. There are just things that I really shouldn't worry about and I should just focus on my commitment towards God and improving I should have more confidence that I am a follower of Christ and I should use that confidence to spread the word out and show my uh, I guess commitment towards God like putting my hands up during worship or praying for others. God has really been showing me where I was unfortunately lacking in my faith and has helped me or is helping me learn to trust in Him more. 
Uh, my name is Johan. I feel like God has been teaching me a lot about love and loving others and treating people like my family. And I just really enjoyed this experience because I got to uh, bond with everyone like as in my family. God has helped me through camp by letting me give him my burdens and it has been a huge weight off my shoulders. So, yeah. Hey y'all, I'm John. So two years ago, I was here as a high school student. And two years later, I'm here as a counselor. So it's really God really giving me the power and opportunity to help the students. That makes me very happy and see them getting close to God and read their Bible. So I'm really happy to come here. Wait, I forgot what I was going to say. Wait, go back. Um, the things that I really enjoyed about this camp was like the worship in the chapel because Pretty much every message that I like received, it was like a breakthrough room for me, and like it showed me what I needed to work on and what I'm doing good. So yeah, um, thanks for watching. Obviously, God is on the move, and He's moving mountains even here in Torrance First Baptist Church. If you guys can please join with us in praying for our students as they made these commitments to Jesus, that they would be lifelong. We don't want the camp high, right? We want it to just continually growing. So if you can just help us. And also, I just want to say thank you to the church for your love, your support, and your prayers. All right, thanks. How many of you guys can hear me now? <laughs> Sweet. Um, how many of you guys are just tired this morning? Raise your hand. You know, I was feeling the exact same way. And uh, even during prayer, I was like, we pray here in the morning. I'm like, I just don't want to pray. I don't feel like it. And um, we sang that first worship song, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. And I'm like, man, I feel like that's just way more important than my tiredness, you know? And then to be able to see all the testimonies at camp and to see how awesome these kids are and these leaders are to still be here after spending like nights up it's just like man what excuse do i have to not give joy to god you know what i'm saying so if if you're feeling tired right now i don't want to say that's fake or whatever but we there's an excitement that comes with serving god so let's do that together let's try to let's just conjure up a spirit of worship today so if y'all may stand with me um we're gonna be starting us off with uh song called Our God. So, let's do this. Three. Our God is healer, 
Awesome and power, our God. Our God, our God is greater. And our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power, our God. Our God. our God is for us, who can be against us? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? Our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? This next song we're going to be singing is Give Me Faith, and the chorus goes like this. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. We're going to be talking about more rules of life, and sometimes it can be hard to trust what the Word of God says, but we're called to do it anyways, so may this be a reminder to us. Lord God, we need you. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. All I am and all I am. I surrender, oh, give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. To soften my heart and break me apart, I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. All I am is all I am. I surrender all. I surrender. you say that your good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life
Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. you never will. Amen. In this last song, we're going to be singing from the inside out, and the words I would like you to focus on are just let justice and praise become my embrace. thousand times I fell, still your mercy remains. But should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. above all else. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The yard of losing my soul in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all pain. Yeah, my heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out. above all else your will above all else my purpose remains the yard of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all my heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all things. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out.
my heart and my soul. I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out from the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out, Lord. Lord, we just come to you today that we'll be able to hear your message through Pastor Jared. Lord, we pray that you would tear us from the inside out, that you would us underneath, not our desires, God. Lord, we just pray that we would grow closer to you today and this morning, and we pray that we would just continue to carry this out in our week. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. tape. I like taped it on and then I had to, I taped the mask onto my face too. So apologize for that. Um, Let justice and praise become my embrace. Consume me, change me, fill me so that from the inside out, I can't help but birth, burst forth in praise. Amen. Amen. Who wants to give God control today? Oh, that's not a lot of hands. Who wants to give God control? Who wants God to control our lives today? What would that mean if we allowed him to actually control every part of our being? Every part. Every part. Would we have some things that maybe need changing in our lives? Maybe God wants to take a little scalpel and do a little surgery on us. Maybe God needs to take some, uh, some tape and tape you up where you might be ripped apart and broken and inside. Maybe you need some more faith. And so we pray, like the song said, give me faith to trust what you say, that your love is good and, and, and you're great, God. How many of us need that today? We need to learn more about how trustworthy God is, how much he loves us, and how, how, what, what kind of a plan and a purpose that he has for you and I. Well, I'll tell you, there's one place that we can go for that. We can go straight to God's word because he is good and his word is true and it is beautiful. So let's remember it as such. Um, Praise God. We've had some amazing things go on this week, some things that we need to be thankful for and and just really excited about. Our high schoolers going off to camp and having a great time. I had the opportunity to go up there. I got this really cool black wristband right here. Um, that shows you that I was there and it was different than everybody else's because I get free stuff. (laughs) So I tried not to take too much advantage of that. I did get a few like shakes, as you can tell by my um, svelte or not so svelte, uh, you know, figure today. Um, I blessed Matt with something uh, and and others. Um, uh, But what I didn't want to do was take too much advantage because, I mean, I could have got all kinds of free swag. I could have got like t-shirts and hats and all that stuff. And 
Um, I felt like that was like, oh boy, I don't want to do that. But it was, it was great to be up there to see what these kids are, are, are about and what they're leaders. So it was, a, it was an amazing, amazing time. We also have to say a big, huge thank you to God for Carla having a great uh, surgery and a great outcome of that. And, and she's on her road to mending. So let's praise God for that. Of course, she's got some pain, so we need to pray for the pain management. But um, God is good and, and used the surgeon to really bring healing to, to her back um, and get Michael to, you know, Man up, right, Michael? You manning up at the house now? <laughs> it's nothing new for Michael, nothing new, right? Awesome. Um, we do have a couple of things coming up. We have our kids' camp that leaves today. So let's pray for our uh, four uh, parent leaders that are going up the mountain. Um, and let's pray for our kiddos. How many kids are going? Do we know? Ten. Ten. Thank you, Miss Penelope. Ten kids heading up to, to Forest Home today. Um, so pray for them just that they'll have a great camp. I heard that they're supposed to have their swimsuits on under their clothes because the exact minute that they arrive at camp, they're jumping in that pool. What do you think I want to do right now? Jump in a pool. You got it. You got it. But some, some things that we need to pray for as well. Debbie is having a surgery this week on her foot. She, you notice she's been walking around with that little boot on for, I mean, feel like years now. But God is uh, going to use uh, that time and really bring healing to her foot as well. So we're, we're expecting God to do big things. Um, and I hope that that's the case for each of us, that when we come, we expect God to do big things in our lives. Um, and, and that happens when we give him control. Now, if you guys remember last week, I mentioned blogs. Anybody now a blogger? One. We got one that took me up. on. I know Jeremy already was a blogger. Um, so, hey, blogs are cool, right? Web blogs. Um, but I realize that most of you probably weren't going to take me up on that to, to be a blogger. Um, but here are a couple other rules for life that I found. You guys ready for these? Here you go. Number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. All right, that's a good one. Okay, number two, treat yourself like you are someone you are responsible for helping. All right, um, I'm not going to repeat it. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Okay. Um, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Ooh, that's a good one. All right, uh, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Okay, um, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Okay, okay. Um, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. How about tell the truth, or at least don't lie? Okay. Um, how about assume the person you are listening to might know something that you don't? Oh, Number 10, be precise in your speech. Number 11, do not bother children when they are skateboarding. And number 12, pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. <laughs> now, actually, actually, these are from renowned or perhaps infamous, depending on who you talk to, psychologist, professor, YouTube personality, blogger, and author, Jordan Peterson. Um, not a believer in, in Christ as far as I know. Um, perhaps an atheist, perhaps an agnostic. I don't know. He's got some weird thoughts and some good thoughts. Some of those were good. Some were weird. Um, but I, he wrote them from a book called 12 Rules for Life. I have not read the book nor do I necessarily intend to. Maybe I should. I don't know. It might be dribble. Who knows? But that's not the point, right? The point is that this is just one example of so many that are trying to do this, right? Rules for life. Do a search on the internet. Rules for life. Boom! You got a long, long list of books and blogs and vlogs and every other og you can imagine. It is there because people are trying to figure out how to live in this world, this crazy, messed up, mixed up world that we live in, people are just trying to figure out how to live, how to, how to 
behave and, and how to articulate what people say are moral absolutes. And the crazy thing is, even relativistic atheists try to do this. Now, does that make any sense to you? If you're a relativistic atheist, A, you don't believe that there's a God, B, you believe that all truth is relative, how in the world are you writing down rules for life? It makes no sense, but you'll find them everywhere. So, rather than going to the so-called experts in the world, if we desire to know the truth, to know how we ought to live in this world, unless, of course, you are a psychopath or a sociopath, which hopefully none of you are in this room today, God is true, and anything that is true comes from the source of truth, which is God. So like we did last week, we're going to skip the blogs and the vlogs and the self-help books and go straight to the source, and that is God and His Word. Last week, we continued with Moses on the mountain as he received this book of the covenant from God. We looked at various ceremonial laws and civil laws, which are no longer binding to us today under the new covenant in Jesus' blood, but nonetheless gave us some important rules for life. And this week, we're going to finish looking at this book of the covenant, dealing with more rules for life. Yes, I know I'm so creative in my titles, but more rules for life today, which reveal the character of God. And once again, point to the universal moral laws love God, and love people, okay? But before we do so, let's bow in prayer. Join me, please. Father, we thank you that you are a God who is so good to us, that you have not left us without your word, that you have not left us without these rules for life. Lord, our job now is to, to, to get on our knees before you and seek the master and let you take control so we can understand and know and be able to live out these rules that you have given for us to do. And these are not rules that, are, that are, are binding, but these are rules that are freeing. So help us to see it as such, to give you control and allow you to move. Teach us today from your word. May we have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that is open. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'll turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 22. We're going to kind of book it through today. Um, so Exodus chapter 22 beginning in verse 16 and 17. Our ESV pew Bibles, if you notice, those are the, the uh, Bibles that you have in the pews now, or the ESV, that's what I preach out of, and that's what you might see up on the screen as well. But they, they head this section, laws about social justice, um, which may or may not be a good word in these days, I don't know. But NIV breaks it into two, calling them social responsibility and the laws of justice and mercy. And the NASB, New American Standard, simply calls them various laws. Now, if I may say a word about these headings, they're not Scripture, so who really cares, right? So if you're reading through God's Word and you come across one of those headings that says laws about, that's not in God's Word. It's just the editors who decided we want to help people kind of have some organization and understand kind of what this, this section is saying, and that's basically it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our theme from last week, rules of civility, because that's exactly what these are. These are rules of civility. They're laws about responsibility, about justice, about fairness, and things of that sort. So the first point then that we're going to see in verse 16 and 17 is civility and the covenant of marriage. So if you'll read with me verse 16 and 17, it says, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. Now, that's a great passage to start on today, is it not? Um, I, I'm glad we're getting this out of the way at, this, at the top, but without going into too much detail, basically this rule is a, a continuation of the rules of responsibility, civility and responsibility. We, we ended with this last week, and I want to clarify two things. First, this is not a case of force. Man is not forcing the woman to be in a relationship with him in this case. It, we might think so by that word seduce, but that's not what that means in this context, because if it was, the, the man would actually be put to death, because in Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 17, it, it actually says if that happens, you're to put the man to death. Okay? Also, a bride price. 
We might look at that and go, bride price? You mean I got to pay for a bride, like some mail-order bride or something like that? Or, um, or, or my goodness, does that mean she's my property? No, bride price doesn't mean property, okay? It, it, uh, it's not a purchase, making the bride some sort of commodity. It is a compensation to make sure that the bride is provide for, provided for and taken care of um, in, this, in that day and, and time. So don't see it as, oh my goodness, we're, we're you know, mail-order brides. That's not what it's about, okay? In this case, what it says is the, the responsibility is given to the man to, well, be a man. Be a man. Man up. Pull up your big boy trousers, and if you're gonna, you know, do things that you shouldn't be doing before marriage, you better man up and take responsibility for that, right? God so values the marriage bed and the marriage covenant that he wants to make sure that everything is done in the right way, not before, not outside of, nothing. If a couple wants to have the joy that comes with sexual relationship, they need to take the responsibility that comes along with it too, right? Now, talk about our day and age. Talk about what's going on in our culture. There is no responsibility for our actions. We live in a culture that, that basically denies the fact that, that this intimate relationship is meant for marriage. And by the way, God takes it so seriously, this bride price, not cheap. It was the same as several years' wages. Several years' wages. Sad for the man when the father says no. Because let's think about that for a second. If the dad says no, you still have to pay the bride price if this happens. Woo, that, talk about taking responsibility right there. Imagine paying a bride price and having no bride. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Do we think that God is serious about the sanctity of the marriage bed? As Riken says, he says, these laws were designed to promote godly patterns of courtship, marriage, and sex. In that order, leave, cleave, become one flesh. Not vice versa. This is what God has said, okay? And uh, that these rules are so applicable today in light of our culture, which runs so counter to God's design, cheapening the one flesh union between man and woman within the covenant of marriage. And again, it's not because God wants to bind us and control us. It's because God knows what happens when we go outside of his plan. Mistakes are made. Consequences. Families are destroyed. Lives are destroyed. And so, friends, surrender to God and his rules, especially in the realm of marriage and that covenant therein. But let's go ahead and move on. We're going to look at civility now and, and justice for all. The next section from 22, 21 through 27, and then 23, 1 through 9, is bookended by rules regarding the treatment of sojourners, uh, basically foreigners, people who would come in uh, and immigrate to the land of, of Israel. Um, and it basically deals with treating people justly. There's a section in the middle regarding worship. We'll address that in a moment. Um, but what stands behind these rules right here are the fact that they're based on God's character, on the character of the Lord, right? God's people are called beyond merely just keeping these basic rules of civility to really embodying the very character of the Lord in caring for people who are easily oppressed, who, who are easily taken advantage of, and that, that his eyes go out to them. And that's what we want to be aware of today. Even those that might be considered our enemies. Okay, so let's look at the sojourner. Look with me at verse 21 in chapter 22. And then we're going to go all the way down to 23.9. We're going to look at that, two, that book in right there. So verse 22 says, sorry, verse, uh, I don't know where to go. Uh, 21, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. And then down to the bookend of 23.9, it says, You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Boy, sojourner, that's a hard word to say. Um, 
<laughs> say that five times fast. But anyways, um, being sojourners or foreigners themselves in a, in, a, in a foreign land, in the land of Egypt, themselves being mistreated and oppressed by the Egyptians, the people are, should, should know and understand what that feels like. And so they should actually be ones to show grace and empathy to outsiders and really with all who are easily oppressed or without the resources to care for themselves. Commentator R. Allen Cole says, love for the resident alien is not based on mere humanitarianism, but on a fellow feeling which comes from a deep personal experience of God's saving grace. Note, this would reveal the heart of God and the character of God and set Israel apart from the nations around them because the nations around them did not care for those outside of the community. They, they wouldn't welcome them in. They wouldn't try to get them to be part of the family at all. So he's saying, look, welcome people. Be kind, be compassionate, because you were given that same grace. Now, now what about you and I? Now, what about you and I? It seems pretty obvious to me, but maybe we were having a hard time kind of try to apply this to our lives. The nations, I want to tell you this, are here. The nations are here amongst us. Go take a walk on the street. The nations are here, you guys, okay? So many people come to the U.S. to seek a better life, to receive education, political asylum, freedom, etc. Now, I'm not talking about whether they do so legally or illegally, so you know, let's put that aside. What I'm saying is those who come here in the right way you know, deserve good treatment. So what this says is, look, one missionary wrote this, and I, I love what he said. I'm keeping this in mind. This is a missionary who had served on foreign fields, okay? He said this, never in the history of the Christian church has a generation of Christians had a greater opportunity to reach the nations of the world than we in North America today. Then he posed this question, can we consistently claim that we are concerned about world evangelism when we are largely ignoring the transplanted foreign mission field which God has brought to us. Whoa. Now, you guys, I am all about foreign missions. I am all about world missions and global outreach. But if we are not reaching our own communities where the nations are here today, boy, oh boy, we need to stop and, and, and you know, take stock. I think our local outreach and, and, and teams, we need to support them and say, hey, guys, what are we doing in our local community to reach people for Jesus Christ because the nations are here? Oh, and by the way, this missionary was writing in the 1980s. How much more of an opportunity is there now? Okay? So who are the rest of these people that they're talking about? Now, Jesus himself refers to these as the least of these. Well, the second category outside of the sojourner is orphans and widows. Look at verse 22 of chapter 22 through 24. It says, You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child, and if you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with a sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Whoa. Whoa. That's some heavy-duty stuff right there, is it not? Think about that for a second. These are members of the community, and these members of the community have no ability to provide for themselves. Notice that punishment, the wrath of God, death, and the sad irony of leaving your wife without a husband and kids without a father. And you may think, oh my goodness, that, that, that's not real. He's not really serious about that? Well, no, he is. And Israel actually did break this rule many, many times. Many times. Uh, it is often called out by the prophets. James, addressing what must have been a similar situation in the church, picks this up in James 1.27 when he says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, this rule should be no surprise to any of us because it reflects the very heart of God, who is, as Psalm 68, 5 says that Raj read earlier, a father to, a fa to the fatherless and a defender to the widows. 
So we're to take care of orphans and widows. We're also to take, take care of the poor amongst us. Verse 25, look with me. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. In what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. So the poor are to be taken care of. Boy, do I wish banks and car dealerships would read this rule. My goodness, interest rates are yikes. Well, basically, here what God is telling us, telling the people, don't charge interest to the poor or hold on to the property of the poor as collateral because all you're doing is making them more poor and making it that much harder for them to pay you back. So just don't do that. Assess the situation, right? Show the character of God. There's a reason they're borrowing money in the first place. So showing the character of God would be to help them get back on their feet. Notice, God is not telling them to offer handouts. He's not doing that. But what he is doing is saying, look, lend money without interest. Don't hold things collateral that the people need. For example, their cloak, which was all they had to keep them warm at night. Now, sadly, Amos 2.8 says this of Israel. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. I want you to hear that one more time. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. So they're taking these garments from the poor. They're laying them before the altar of God where we're supposed to give our worship, and they are using them as little mats. And it says this also, and in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Taking advantage of people. And so God says, look, be compassionate. Verse 27, I'm compassionate. Be compassionate towards those. Jesus teaches on this as well in Luke 6, 34 through 36. He says, if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And that passage closes with, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. I know these are hard things to swallow, but we need to be mindful of the poor that live amongst us and have the Lord's eyes for them, okay? Now, this brings us to the next set of the least of these. Your enemy? Now, on the surface, your enemy doesn't seem to fit into this category of the least of these, if you will. But it does fit because the onus is on Israel to go above and beyond, even extending grace to their enemies. Um, look at verse 4 and verse 5 in chapter 23. It says, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Um, now, again, what is this saying? Basically, if, if your enemy's donkey gets out of the garage, bring him back, right? If, 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 your, if your enemy uh, is going on vacation and he breaks down on the side of the road, stop to help him change his tire, <laughs> Lend a helping hand. Early church father Clement of Alexandria commented, the Lord tells us to relieve and lighten the burden of the beasts of burden, even when they belong to our enemies. He is teaching us not to take pleasure in the misfortunes of others and not to laugh at our enemies. We should never take pleasure in the misfortunes of anyone. But secretly inside, how many times do we do that? Ha ha, they had it coming. Eee. Is that the grace that we're supposed to show? Even though they might deserve it, we should never take 
pleasure in the misfortune of others. Paul picks this up in Romans 12, 19 through 20. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Kill him with kindness, basically. And if by your kindness, your enemy repents and comes to Jesus, then praise God. And if he doesn't, guess what? It's not up to you anyways. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And God will enact justice because he is a God who is just. And so justice will be served. But leave that to him, okay? And let's not forget what Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And if you're still wondering why he wants us to love our enemies, Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Later on, he even talks about how we were actually enemies of God. So we're all without Jesus, enemies of God. So let's extend that grace even to our enemies. Now the rest, underlying much of the rest of this section, verses one through three and and six through eight, um, is the command to not bear false witness, right? These could be false reports, rumors, hearsay, one side of the story, gossip, the popular or the majority opinion. Maybe it's victim mentality, whatever it might be. Basically, bottom line is this, you guys, in your dealings with everyone, be they rich or poor, be they whatever, you are to show equity, impartiality, honesty, and integrity. Leviticus 19.15 says, do not pervert justice, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. Get that. Don't show partiality to the poor. Be compassionate, be kind, but don't show partiality, but also don't show favoritism to the great right? None of that. But judge your neighbor fairly. Bottom line, our God is a just God, so be just in your actions. A few years back, I had the opportunity, privilege, I don't know what you'd call it, to serve on a civil case in court. I was on a jury for a civil case a few years back. It was a case involving a young lady and a bus company. Uh, The young lady was standing on the bus And the bus came to a stop, and she fell forward, and she broke her finger. And she had to have, like, bones fused in her her finger, right? Um, And long story short, her family sued the bus company for negligence. Uh, They wanted payment for her medical bills, lost time at work, and a few other things, including, and this is what kind of got me, I was like, oh, the embarrassment she might face with one finger shorter than the others. I was like, whoa, wow. Okay, Um, while I feel for her, and I was very, I was like, man, poor thing. She had to go through pain and had to have a surgery on her finger, and that's sad, and it's going to be hard for her to write because it was her her writing hand. I I get it. That's that's hard, and so compassionately, I had compassion, but that's not justice. Justice didn't prevail by suing the bus company and doing that. Now, the jury was actually, you know, had good heads on their shoulders, and I went along with the majority opinion, and... (laughs) No, she didn't get any money. And I, my point in that is honesty and integrity, taking responsibility, being impartial, and of, all of these were factors in my decision. My heart went out to this lady, but justice prevailed. And, and should you ever have the opportunity or the privilege, whatever you want to call it, of serving on a jury, I only hope that you will remember some of these rules for life that the Lord has for us and do the right thing, okay? Do the right thing. And then we come to our next main section, which is more rules for worship. If you remember at the beginning of last week, we mentioned the bookend of the rule of worship. There are a few scattered rules for worship, which I'll go back to and address, and then we'll close out our time with this closing bookend. Um, Here are some rules for worship that we can glean from these passages today. Look at chapter 22, verse 18 through 20. It says, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. 
Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. Now, you may think those laws seem disjointed, and if you actually read them along with me, you'd be going, ew, right now. Um, Other than the fact that these each carry the death penalty. Now, most commentators point to the fact that these are an affront to the call for Israel to be holy. Sorcery, bestiality, and idolatry were our common practices in pagan Canaan say that five times fast, and and had no part in the life of Israel, which was called to be set apart for God. And do I really need to get into the reasons why? We see them. We know what they are. It's bad. Okay? Run the other way. Of course, we're not putting anyone to death for these sorts of deviant acts today, but obviously there are these universal moral truths which are applicable for us. Now, I want to ask you guys a question. What other practices of the world around us are we called to be separate from? What other practices are we called to be separate from? Because our call to be holy. And along with that is the call to put God first. Looking at verse 28 and following. It says, You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not, you shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen, with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be consecrated to me. Therefore you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. What these verses remind us is that God is in charge. He is in control. He is not to be reviled. He is the one who puts rulers over us. Therefore, we should honor them as long as they are honoring God. And it goes on to remind us that we're to give him the first fruits of all that we have. For the Israelites, that meant their harvest, their wine, their sons, their livestock. It's all committed to God. They're told to consecrate themselves to the Lord and not to eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field, i.e. no roadkill cafe for you. You ever seen those shirts? Ew. This was a matter, though, of ritual purity. And it's probably meant to distance themselves, once again, from anything that was unclean, from unclean animals or the animalistic behavior of the surrounding nations. Again, they were called to be holy, to be separate from the nations around them, and to put God first. You and I are to give him our first and our best to abstain from those things which would be contrary to his character, okay? So on to the the bookend now. Um, Verse 10 through 19 of chapter 23, we're not going to read the whole thing, but they give a number of laws regarding the principle of the Sabbath and other festivals the Israelites were required to keep. They were told to keep the Sabbath, right? In Exodus 23, 10 through 12, the land is to lie fallow. Basically, don't don't plant every seventh year. On that seventh year, it's supposed to not be planted. Let the land rest a little bit. Hey, that's just good advice. Any farmers out there? No, we don't have farmers anymore, do we? Roy's not here. (laughs) But anyways, uh, so we got farmers, right? Um, We don't understand that principle. The principle is, let, let things rest, you know, give, give people a, a rest, a break. God created the world in six days, and he rested on the seventh. Provide for the poor as well. Observe that Sabbath day each week to ensure that the beasts of burden and the servants would get a day off. And, and there's this connection now established between worship and mercy. What does God desire? I don't desire sacrifices. I want mercy, he says. Bring that to the altar. Offer that to me. By the way, any Chick-fil-A fans in the house? The Lord's Chicken? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Anybody want to go there after church today? You can't, can you? Because it's closed on Sunday. Sorry, anyways. Oh, um, and why is it closed on Sunday? Yes. And And this rule actually is precisely the rule... Why Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. Did you know that it costs the company 20% in projected annual sales because they are closed on Sunday? 
20%. They could make 20% more than what they already make, and they already make a lot of money because it is the Lord's chicken, by the way. But anyways, uh, 20%. But the founder, Truett Cathy, wanted to be sure his employees had a day for worship and rest. Isn't that awesome? Yes, it is. And he glorifies God, and he loves his neighbor in that way. And there's other festivals we see. There's, there's this commandment, no other gods before me, he says in verse 13 of chapter 23. Uh, and in fact, he says, don't even mention their names. Again, this was to remind them that during their religious ceremonies, no other gods were to be invoked. Three specific feasts are mentioned, some other explanatory material. Um, these, these are feasts that reflect the agricultural year as a reminder of God's provision for them. And they would even make a pilgrimage to the tabernacle or the temple. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was mentioned at the time of Exodus in which we actually come to celebrate the Lord's Supper today as, as this continuing sign of God's provision for us. To remind them of their time in Egypt. The Feast of the Harvest, to remind them that their first fruits belong to God. And the Feast of Ingathering, to remind them that everything they have is from God. All of these days are no longer binding to you and I today. They're part of the ceremonial law, but those principles are clear, right? Celebrate our freedom from sin. Gather together and celebrate the Lord's table, which is what we're going to do in a minute. Offer God all that we are and remember that all belongs to him. And then we come to the end, verse 19b. I had someone call me out on this the other day because I just sort of um, mentioned this. I was talking about these various rules and stuff and um, here we come again to that boiled kid. You guys ready for this? Verse 19b. I'm just going to read that real quick. What does it say? It says, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, how many of you guys actually thought I was saying, you know, God was making a rule, don't boil a child? Okay. Thank you for being so honest. I love that. Awesome. And on surface, okay, no, it's a young goat. And you may, what is the deal with that? Why this rule here? Um, you shall not boil young goats in its mother's milk. It's not a human kid that this is addressing. Baby goat. Most likely, this had been some sort of a pagan practice, like a fertility ceremony that existed in the, in the nations around them. Whatever the case, Jewish philosopher Philo said that it was grossly improper. And Riken explains it may be seen as a gross violation of the natural order, the young goat should drink its mother's milk and gain life from it, not be cooked in it. Basically, again, what is God saying? He's saying, do the right thing. Be responsible. Love people. Take care of this world that I've, I've given you. Um, don't take advantage of people. All these things, right? Because that's what these rules are about. It's revealing his character. Now, that ends our two-week journey through the book of the covenant. Praise God. You're like, yeah, we get to move on from this. Ushers, I want you to get ready for our time of communion, please. And as they are doing that, as they are doing that, I want us to be reminded of two things as we reflect back on this passage. Number one, this will look a lot like it did last week too. <laughs> Number one, love people by treating them civilly. Love people by treating them civilly. Now, we should treat others the way God has treated us, right? If we're strong, we should notice the weak and our heart should go out to them. Who is an outsider? Who is alone? Who is unprotected? Who is poor? If we belong to God, then these people are our responsibility. What are we doing to help them? And if we're weak, if you're in this category, if you're an orphan or a widow or the poor, guess what? This is good news for you because we have the promise of God's protection. Once again, God is gracious. Let's not forget that. And then secondly, love God by worshiping Him appropriately. Those bookends are clear. There is one God. He is our God who is higher than any 
other. He is the creator of all. He deserves our first and our best because he has brought us out of slavery and provided us rest in him. One of the ways that we worship him appropriately is to observe communion. In it, we reflect on what the Lord has done in Christ. Ushers, Sue, Raj, will you come up? And as the ushers pass the trays, I want you to please take a piece of bread and the cup and hold them in your hands and spend time as Sue plays, reflecting on what Christ has done for us, reminding us that we have a God who is for us and not against us.
know most of you won't recognize that song that Sue is playing, but the phrase in that song that says, is, is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Well, we know who is worthy. The one who allowed his body to be broken for us. He is so worthy Amen. of our praise. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord, we, we tend to have such rebellious spirits. We don't want to listen to your word. And yet, you tell us in your word that these are, these are words of, of life that come from the bread of, of life. And, and man shall not live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so as we take of this bread, we, may be, we be reminded, Lord, of your flesh, that the very word of God was broken for us. We ask that you would bless this. In Jesus' name, amen. This is his body. Take. As we go through the Old Testament, especially where we are in Exodus, see that God's making a covenant with his people, covenant by way of the law. But now we come to the table of the Lord, a covenant by way of grace, undeserved favor. How thankful we are today for the shed blood of Christ which cleanses us of how many of our sins? All, all our sins. Father God, we come to you this morning in great awe of you, great thankfulness for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who would pay the debt we owed but could never pay. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all you have done for us through your shed blood and your resurrection. In your name, Lord. On that night in the upper room, the Lord Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Take and drink all of it in remembrance of me. Randy, please come and lead us. Will you stand with us as we close our service together by singing our closing hymn? Let's sing together, Let's sing together number 516 in your hymnals. The lyrics will be over here.
Amen. The Word of God says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And what are we going to say so today? Hallelujah, I am redeemed. Say it. Hallelujah, I am redeemed redeemed. Let us go in His grace. Let us extend His compassion to a world that is in such need of a Savior. God bless you. God bless you watching at home. We love you. We'll see you soon. Have a great day in His presence.